podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 180 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. 180! Yeah, it's a round number, I like that. That's top on darts, isn't it? 360s on the top of darts. 180! Oh, yes, of course, yeah. Um, so the title of this is Discovering Client Generational Scripts in Therapy. What a wonderful topic. Another one. It's a wonderful topic. And in, T- and we, in TA, of course, this is like uh, food and drink because you're, yeah. trained, you're trained to identify and look at and analyze people's scripts and if we take this podcast and maybe people who aren't in ta may come from other different modalities and have different words for scripts but in ta eric Byrne, who was the originator of ta defined a script as a unconscious life plan yeah he developed in childhood with a beginning middle and end so we but in other words, unconsciously, out of our awareness, we decide very existentially um, who's, a, you know, I'm okay, you're not okay, uh, I'm okay, you are okay, I'm, you know, all these different four existential positions we're talking about at very basic levels. And if we've decided for whatever reasons, for example, that we have a harmful script or a hopeless script or a banal script or I could go on, we often enact that way of living in life. Yeah. The therapist is taught to help the client identify that, be aware of those decisions they may have made around surviving in a certain way and how they may enact out those same decisions, which actually doesn't help them. And, And as we identify those scripts, we work with them. Now, the idea of intergenerational scripts is that they're passed down from generation to generation like hot potato. Yeah. I love that. When I learned that as part of the course, it made so much sense to me. I had somebody in today and she was talking about her mother who was alcoholic. And then she said, oh, the first person I had a relationship with for quite a long time was very abusive. Was an alcoholic. Yeah. And you you'd you'd think, wouldn't you? If I wasn't a psychotherapist or just on the street, you'd think, well, if you've had a mother who's an alcoholic but and it was so dysfunctional and so XX for your life, how come you would then enact out the same process in life with someone? How come you would pick somebody with that? And of course, as sort of st- you know, odd, I think that is from a human level. I understand it psychologically. Absolutely. Because we carry on our scripts, our, our life plans, our way of looking at life based around familiarity, predictability, yep. continuity, yep. and what makes up our identity and what's familiar. Yeah. Even if it's hurting us, even if it's painful, the familiarity and the predictability overrides it. Yeah. Yeah. And we that makes up our identity. And so to start changing our way of looking at lives about ourselves and other people isn't something we give up early. It's not something we give up easily. No. And I think there's some really valuable work, you know, to be done and that I've done with clients, having that realization that those sometimes beliefs aren't ours it wasn't a conscious decision that we made to do that it is being passed down it is that hot potato and it's okay to give it them back <laughs> yeah yeah it's certainly okay to give them back i think i i think in another podcast two years ago i might have given the same example when i was talking about depression but i, I think it fits into this podcast so i'm going to say it again so many moons ago um i saw this woman at the institute for an assessment because of the last 25 years i've done assessments passed on people 
to the different therapists. And this woman came in, and she was about 45, at least. Uh, I remember quite well. Um, and she sat on the city, and I sat on the opposite city. I said, OK, we've got half an hour. My job is to assess your mental health and then pass you on to the therapist to suit you. What is it you've come with? And she looked me in the eye, and she said, I've come with depression. I've been depressed for the last 25 years. I've been on all these different types of drugs and you're my last hope. Wow. No pressure, Bob. No pressure there. So I said, who sent you then? She said, my doctor. I've, I've had a new doctor who favours talking therapies and he knows of your institute and you've been recommended and your name personally has been recommended. And I said, oh, that's very kind. However, my job is here is to pass it to somebody else. So I assume what you want to then is to explore and understand who you are and, you know, do something else than being depressed. So she looked at me and she said, you can't do anything else than being depressed. You're either depressed or you aren't depressed. So I said, oh, right, okay. So let's think about this, that if you were depressed, what would you like to be? And she eventually said, relaxed and content. Um, and then she said, but I've always been depressed. So I said, OK, so tell me a little bit about your mum, your dad, significant other people, brothers and sisters, where you come from. And I just started to say that. I'll tell you about my mother, she said. And I said, oh, OK, then she said, well, as you, it's interesting as you're talking. She was a, she was depressed as well for all her life. So I said, oh, right, so you were born into a, a family of a depressed mother. Yes, and my father. Wow. Oh, right. So, but my mother was worse. She would go to bed and incapacitate herself, and she couldn't get up when she was depressed. I said, oh, so that's the way your mother perhaps solved problems, was it, or modeled to you that under stress, you incapacitate yourself. Uh, well, I never looked at it like that, I suppose. Um, Yes, yes, I suppose she might have modelled that to me. Ah, right, so really, your depression then isn't really your depression. And she looked at me as if I was speaking foreign language. Yeah. She said, do you saying to me that my depression isn't my depression? Well, it looks like it's been passed down or how to be depressed anyway, has been passed down from your mother. And she stood up and she looked at me and she says, that's it. It's never been my depression, has it? I said, well, it sounds like it's been passed down to you. And then she sat down and she says, well, what do I do now then? <laughs> that is the big question. <laughs> now I said, well, I'm going to pass you to a therapist who's very good in this area. And you can explore the depression and see where you go from there. So I sent her away. And then about, I would think, I don't know, four or five months later, and those days I'd come in early to therapy, I'd come in. And I don't know why, it was about eight o'clock in the morning. She was having a very early session. Uh, I think she must have finished the night. Anyway, we bumped into each other. And she remembered me more than I remembered her, to be honest. And she said, Bob! I said, yes, trying to remember who she was, but I did remember who she was. Um, she says, I've done it. I said, I said, what have you done? And she said, I've given my depression back to my mother. Bless. So I said, and how do you feel? Oh, she says, I feel light. I feel lighter uh, for the uh, since the last 25 years. I said, gosh, she said, and then she said, what do I do next, Bob? <laughs> I said, well, I'd stay in therapy and uh, talk about how you can integrate these new ways of being into your life. Uh, because, you know, psychotherapy is a process, never an event. But this is a really good step. And there's an example of an intergenerational script, which has been passed down and modeled down to, to her. She carried that way of being in on and on and 
she had children and I'm sure she was beginning to pass that down to her children. And now by coming to therapy, handing the uh, depression back, she not only stops it for herself, but she just changes the whole process and she doesn't carry on with the hot potato phenomena I'm talking about. Are all scripts generational? Or do we have our own? Oh, story. Don't you think that's marvellous? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Oh, that realisation is yeah. massive insight. Yeah. I just think it was wonderful. Ghosts, are all scripts inter intergenerational? Here we are. Now, um, I would say, I think... I'll say most scripts because I can't think of any that aren't. Uh, origins. I'll say I'll say most because I can think of another few then are taken down from their parents or significant other people. Yes. Can we do we we create our script out of nothing? So or some. I think if there's been some sort of trauma or crisis early in childhood, we may decide certain ways of being with ourselves and other people and therefore we create a, a sort of more uh, original life script which is maybe different from our parents which has been in response to the trauma yeah. yes but in in general i think life plans and how to be and not to be are passed down because we don't always or my understanding of the script and this is why i love transactional analysis is that this stuff, this script isn't done to us. We uh -huh. have an active part in it. Do you know what I mean? If you have a depressive parent or a depressive mum, you can make the decision that I'm going to be really happy and not like things worry me. I'm not going to be like that or I am going to be like that. So okay. we we make decisions around this as well that then make yeah. it ours. So Accept that script, I agree with you. <laughs> and part of ourselves might, and part of ourselves might not. So yeah. we have to be parts of ourselves. So nothing two and two doesn't necessarily make four. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly enough, though, there's positive scripts and negative scripts, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, positive, at least I think is positive. Now, I I used to think as a parent uh about my legacy and I used to think about what am I passing down in terms of belief systems and morals to my daughter? I remember, I don't know what age she was, uh, 13 or 14, but we had, we were talking a bit deep for Mark, 13 or 14 year old, isn't it? But anyway, we talk about morals and belief systems. Perhaps she was a bit older, actually. And she said, Dad, what have you, what's been really important that you've passed down to me? Uh, and I said, well, number one, I hope I've passed down the importance of the attitude of kindness, right? Yeah. This discussion with her. So, I think two weeks ago when I went to, it was my 74th birthday, and I went with Jessica, my daughter, John, Steph, and Jessica's godmother to a restaurant. And we, start, we were talking about morals and belief systems. And I said, you know, Jessica, do you remember all those years ago when I said, well, I've just said to you about kindness of attitude being so important in terms of belief systems. And John, who's the husband, said, do you know what, uh, Bob? Kindness is so important to Jessica and she would define herself as a kind person. And I would say she's very, very kind. So you oh. succeed in passing down. Yeah. And that's what I mean. That's the positive. The positive, yeah. Yeah. Made a decision, whether it was in their awareness or not, that it's important to be kind to people. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> though I think she made that, I'm not sure she made so intensely, even if she did that is important to be kind to herself. Yeah. So you can take, you interpret, I think, or you may interpret the message that's been passed down 
in a certain way. Yes, yeah. I, I think I, that's what I was meaning, Bob. Yeah. What were you? What do you mean? You were meaning? Say a little bit more. When I said before about, do you know what I mean? You make a decision, you have a choice. It's open to interpretation as well, isn't it? We make we put our own slant on it. Yeah. So she, yes, absolutely. This is a, that's a really good example of what you just said there. Yeah. But yeah. But you are right. It is a two way choice. Yeah, and I think that's what I like about it because if if things are done to us, we don't get an, a choice to change it. Whereas if we understand and become aware that it was a decision that I made based on my environment, then I've got the option to re-decide it. And there is re-decision therapy. It's part of therapy, isn't it? Where you you mm. take an old belief and see if it's still working. <laughs> yeah, that's why if you go back to Freud, I'm not sure he ever used the word scripts. I'm sure he didn't. Uh, I'm young, uh, early psychoanalyst. And, and Henry Byrne, who used to be a demand of psychoanalysis, he would talk about the script or the early life plans being formed in the age of three to six, for example. Yeah. Or he used to say the same sort of thing. But as more sort of psychologies and psychotherapies developed, you've quite, quite a lot of authors, I was thinking of Bill Cornell, for example, who talk about what we were talking about earlier in this podcast is that we we can make new scripts out of trauma in other words or life crisis or things that happen to us in developmental stages yeah or deficits what you were talking about we can create a script out of that so it doesn't no so he would be arguing that those early decisions don't necessarily happen at between three and six or before four or whatever it is they can be reviewed checked redecided or even made anew according to what happens to us in our developmental cycles of life. Yes. And I I, I can remember doing the four years personal therapy while I was doing my training and working out my script was one of the one things that I wanted to do. And it was literally like peeling back layers of an onion because there's so many protective mechanisms around our script. It's so deep. We, the way I look at it is that we we wrote it so young that we don't even remember making the decisions that we did. Yes. So you, you need to kind of unearth it gently to work out mm. Mm. what's actually involved in it. Yeah. So if you've, de if uh, you are you absolutely correct? I think if we've developed, let's say, a workaholic script, then or a, you know. A hopelessness script even or yeah. a harmful script or I'll talk about the negative sides of scripts now uh, then we make it so early in our life we almost becomes a way of living rather than thinking about it as a way of choice yes yeah absolutely yeah hmm. and one of the things I I still do now you know when I'm seeing clients is to warn them that you know, when you're stepping out of your script, you're going to probably feel anxious. You're probably going to feel off kilter. It's a good thing, but I'm just letting you know, do you know what I mean? That sometimes you might feel worse before you feel better. You are completely right, Jackie. And of course, script is linked directly to sense of identity. Yeah, yes, yeah. And when your identity has been challenged in some way, all those things that you just talked about, you will feel. Yeah. You'll feel off kilter. Or you'll be saying, well, this isn't familiar. Yeah. Or, well, I don't know what to do now. Well, I always did this. I always turned left. But now you're asking me to turn right. And I, th I think you touched on this earlier on, that, you know, it's okay having the realisation and changing the script, but it's then what do we replace it with? Is that integrating the the other parts of us that's really important, I think, because otherwise there's just a big anxious void there if we're getting people to change the yeah. behaviour so radically. It needs to be a, a new script to put on the road. Yeah, absolutely. And to test it out. Yeah, the therapist to help you integrate that new script and to test it out. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's that takes a while in therapy. Yeah, I love work around script. It makes sense. I think we all have a story. Oh, all of us. And I think it's really important to remember that what you said, and I'm glad you said it right at the beginning of the podcast, the scripts are bilateral. In other words, you, you can choose to have a different script. Yes, yeah. You can hand back the script you never perhaps even wanted in the first place. And that's what I love about this. It, it's it's evolving, it's changing all the time. Like you said, if you go through a trauma now, it will impact on your script and the, your beliefs and everything else. But th there's a there's a line to it that that we do play a part in. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, if we're talking about empowerment, yes, there's nothing more empowering, I think, than to give part back parts of your script, if you like, um, which were unhealthy, and to put a new script on the road. Yeah. A bit more empowering than that. But you do need to do with the therapist because you often don't know what plan there is because you've been so focused on the other way of being. Yeah. That's why I say if you've always turned left, it's pretty wobbly or risky to turn right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a well-trodden path down the other one. It's familiar. It might hurt us. It might not lead us to, you know, being the happiest or whatever, but we know how it works. And you're yeah. saying we're going to go this way where there's no path. <laughs> so if we've always, always been abused, yeah. You know what it's like to be abused. Yeah. You know what it likes to be harmed. Yeah. You know what it's like to survive perhaps abuse. So, and this may seem very strange for people listening to this podcast, but we may choose to stay in abused relationships because we know how to be. Yeah. And to move towards a healthy relationship. Many people might think it's that straightforward, but it's so often it's the opposite. It's safety and security in the familiar, even if it's damaging. Mm. And it, it's going, it's, it's stepping into that unknown and uncertain thing when we're letting things go and trying to put a new script on the road that is really scary place to be. So I can remember being scared when I was making changes. Yeah, it'd be really odd if it wasn't. Yeah. It's me, anyway. Yeah. And um, even now, I think the thing with me is awareness. Do you know what I mean? Because I know now, I still do go back into my old scripty stuff, but I know when I'm in it. And sometimes I'll stay in it for a while. <laughs> but then I can step out of it again, if that makes sense. It does. If I'm tired, if I'm not feeling well, I revert back to the old plan a lot of the time. Yeah, and to help a person understand what you're talking about here, and they can redecide and change, it's so empowering. Yeah, that's another good word. I like that word. Yeah, it's so empowering, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I like to think I look back. Oh, well, I say I'm seventy-four, but I look back. Went to I first went into therapy when I was thirty-five. Now I I would all I would say to you probably if I had access to therapy with that. All the time, even though not one, you know, every week or something. But uh, there was a time when it was every week. Um, but I look back now, and when I say, "Oh, I've, I've changed my life through therapy," I could say, put another language on it, and say, "I've changed fundamentally my life plan." Yeah. The script that was handed down to me. Yeah. Now, as a professional psychotherapist for 40 years, I know I've retired now, and I do go around and teach people how to do therapy in different countries. But um, I can't think of a job that would leave me more with a sense of purpose and professional pleasure than helping people change that fundamentally. Yeah. I think one of the things with the scripts that, I don't want to say it always happens, but happens an awful lot is when, you know, clients have done the work and they've made some changes. 
they then start to be I don't want to say harsh on themselves, but it is harsh. It's like, why did I not know this before? Why did I not do this earlier? So th there's like a a process after it of being compassionate with yourself and understanding that, do you know what I mean? You did what you did for the right reasons at the time. There's a word for that. Go on. Normalisation. Good, because I do that a lot with my clients. <laughs> How people understand that in the circumstances they were in that was perfectly normal yeah they made that decision absolutely and from that place it's very hard or challenging to even see another way yeah and you're right again most people are, are very unfortunately i'll say this to you um often have a very negative narrative which makes change pretty problematic because as a therapist one thing i always aimed at was helping the client have a kind attitude and a and a friend in other words they were on their own side yes yeah and all this what we're talking about here by the way is in-depth psychotherapy that will take time absolutely yeah yeah this does not happen overnight no, I, I, like I said, it took me probably the whole four years to work through my script. And I'm probably, I'm sure that there's still parts that I haven't worked through even now, but it's something that I always go back to. Yeah. And if you go back and back to your, you know, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your great, great, great grandpas, you will see. I, I believe this, uh, and I haven't luxury of being able to go back and back and back and back, but if I did, and I often, I often think about this, by the way, you would see familiar traits. Yeah. You might want to call scripts. Yeah. From generation to generation to generation. And it's only when people come to therapy, they perhaps make two and two makes four, and maybe if they've got the courage to change that whole generational cycle. Yeah. No, it'd be done with a the therapist. Impossible to do it yourself. Oh, it's hard enough with a therapist sometimes to work it all out. But there's also something, I think, for me about... Um, I don't know whether honouring the past is the right way of putting it. Do you know what I mean? But the same way that we're fumbling through life a lot of the time. So we're our parents. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's yeah. And of course, their great grandfather was. Yes. I mean, I could trace back, you know, my parents' you know, traits and everything else and what was passed on to me. And I really only managed to change a lot of that hot potato phenomena with help from my therapist over time. Um, and thank goodness I did, because my life would have been very different otherwise. So when you talk about intergenerational scripts, yes, they're all there. The other part of this, can we change them? Yes, we can. But we need somebody to help us be aware of the process. And we need to integrate it all once it's done. It's not just finding it out. We need to be a whole person on the other side of it yeah and yeah it is a big question isn't it for you and me but do we become i'm going to say the answer is yes before i'm going to ask the question but anyway would i like that when i know the answer <laughs> okay. question is do we become psychotherapists from our own scripts and i think the answer is yes yeah me too because really, part of my script or antithesis script, um, either way, was to help people in ways that I didn't have help to myself. Yeah. I get and that 100%. I think it's a decision I made as I went into therapy and made the changes myself. This is why I believe we... We develop new scripts as we go along according to certain life crises. Yeah. 
um, that I this was a job I could really do because I knew I knew how to help people in areas because I didn't get the help myself. So not only give, did it give purpose and passion to my job, and not only did I think I was good at it, but I think I, yeah, I think therapy became a way of life because of that. Yes. Yeah. That's a new script. Yeah. And for me as well, I, I get so much from my clients because I'm doing this work over and over. Yeah. Again, it's working on myself and do you yeah. know what I mean? I'm ever evolving. I'm not, I'm certainly not the same as what I was two years ago, four years ago. No. And, and there's something wonderful about that, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. We're always evolving and, you know, I don't know what you believe about after life and, but I, 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 I think certainly since I'm in my seventies anyway, I'm in my sixties probably. I, I used to think about the shortness of life. Yeah. But script, even though it may endure for seventy years, eighty years, say let's say eighty, ninety, and even perhaps if we don't change them, I think that oh, sorry, unless we might not change them until we're seventy, for example. Because I remember. I, I've done work with people who've been in their 70s and 80s. You know, I think that people can change and put new scripts on the road, whatever age they are. Absolutely, yeah. Never too late. No, no, but they've got to be ready for it. It's got to be something that they they want to do. Some people are quite happy in their script. They, they just replay it over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody in today who was 46 that said, and said it's, in a different language, exactly what you were talking about here now, then the same patterns over and over and over and over. And you used to say, well, I'll dust myself down and I'll carry on again, and I'll dust myself down and I'll carry on again. And the same patterns, the same cycles, the same people. I saw the same red flags in relationships, and she went into the red flags, even she, even though she knew them, because it was familiar to be abused. And there we go, there we go, and there we go, and a 46 She's decided the discomfort is too high. She's recognised the repetitive patterns and she's reached out for help. Yeah, which and, is brilliant. And some people can go 70 years just doing the same yeah. thing over and over. Yeah, yeah. They do. And she couldn't. She could put in her level of predict. It's, you see, I think it's when the discomfort comes too high. I totally agree, yeah. There's usually a shift, something's happened and the decision has been made yeah. that I don't want to keep doing this. And that's when then the work can be done. Yeah. And often, you know, the other the other aspect here is, besides what I've said about discomfort, when they don't want to pass the same patterns on to their children. Yeah. Now that is a very I've heard that so many times. Yeah, the, the the book stops here. Um, the cycle stops. It's not being passed on. I hear that a lot. Yeah. yeah, I might die in ten years' time, but I want my children. Yeah, a different type of life that I never had. So scripts are intergenerational. Yes, yes, we a bit like yes, <laughs> they are, and they can be positive, healthy. However. The scripts I mostly work with because people come through my doors absolutely you know, have problems or difficulties are usually aspects of negative scripts. Yeah. Yeah. And but I think you, we forget that sometimes. Of, uh, yeah, we forget that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And usually, of course, they're the scripts of the internalized parents that they hold in their heads. That's what we mean by intergenerational. Yeah. Uh, and the, another thing that I think you said that, you know, 100% agree is that, you know, we interpret it our own way as well. It's all up for interpretation. It's not direct messages that we're getting. No. Some are, but not all of them. Yeah. Well, talking to you, I just, I thought this before, but I, I feel I sad a moment ago, just a moment ago. I don't see people through my door who, of course, have healthy scripts. And yeah. of course, the population do so yeah, yeah. i don't see them uh, yeah. and i don't know why i felt sad about that but i did feel i should be feel happy but uh that i don't that many many people have healthy scripts 
But I think it's important to state because it's a, it's only the people who've got negative scripts, XXX, that I often see, because many people, like Jessica, I hope, if she was listening to her, said, well, I'm glad that I'm kind with people. Yes. I'm glad that I help people. Yeah. I'm glad that I and that you pass down these belief systems. And that makes for a positive script. Because Absolutely. Because you won't take that to therapy. No. I can remember a, a, a one particular weekend on my training where I think I said it to the, you know, whoever was training, this is really depressing, this is. Can we not have some good news? And she said, well, it's out there. It's just you won't see it in the therapy room because that's not why people come to therapy. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. It's they come to therapy primarily many three or four reasons but one of them is the discomfort of their life is too high yeah, or they want to stand themselves and get a different outcome uh, or they don't want their children to carry on the same patterns that they did yeah another wonderful podcast bob thank you it is i think what you talk i think both of us would agree here i think that um what we're talking about here is the nuts and bolts of fundamental psychotherapy. Absolutely. Helping yeah. change their life plan towards other people and themselves in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I say it over and over again, this is why I love transactional analysis, because there are things like the script that make perfect sense that we can work with and explain and everything. Yeah. People are interested in script particularly by TA Today by Ian Stewart. And he talks a lot about scripts in that. It's an unconscious life plan that we've developed outside of awareness to make and bolsters our identity about ourselves, which is often picked up from our parents or significant other people. And but I'm is, sure if people go on your YouTube channel, Bob, there will be something that you've uh, recorded on there about life scripts. <laughs> five or not videos, and I'm sure... If you put script into that, you have many videos about script. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed okay, it. until next time, when what we will be looking at is traps to avoid for effective therapy. We do pick wonderful titles, so thank you for that. Well, you pick them. Are they wonderful? That's a, that's a humdunger of that. Well, we can come up with a fair few traps, and I'm sure I've fallen in most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure that is absolutely true with me as well. So until next time, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Speak soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.